You're listening to the MindPod Network. Support for this podcast is made possible by listeners like you. Head on over to ZachLarry.com and use the Amazon portal to buy your stuff, or just make a donation using PayPal to support this podcast, bringing you content week in and week out. It's all happening. It's all happening. It's all happening. It's all happening. Yoga Sutras with the definition of yoga as the neutralization of the alternating waves in consciousness. This may also be translated as secession of the modifications of the mind style. Chitta is a comprehensive term for the thinking principle which includes the pranic life forces, manas, mind or sense consciousness, ahamkara, which is ego, and hudi, which is intuitive intelligence. Vritti, literally whirlpool, refers to the waves of thought and emotion that ceaselessly arise and subside in man's consciousness. Naroda means neutralization, cessation, and control. Welcome to the podcast, everybody. Episode 104 of It's All Happening with Zach Larry. That is me, your host. I am so happy that you are here. That, of course, is from the Yoga Sutras by Patanjali. And uh, these are Paramahansa Yogananda's comments on the goal of yoga, which appears in book one of the Yoga Sutras. And if you're practicing yoga at all in any shape or form, whether that be asana, the physical practice, meditation, bhakti yoga, kirtan, or you're just standing on your head for eight hours a day um, to improve your digestion and uh, working on the uh, tension and release of your mula bandha because uh, you heard it's a cool thing to do, then you should read the Yoga Sutras by Patanjali. Very, very important. So, But this week on the podcast, we are returning to yoga. Obviously, this podcast has drifted off into some other worlds the last few weeks. But we are returning back to the world of yoga with one of the great Western yogis, um, truly, truly one of the great Western yogis, by the name of Mark Whitwell. And I am going to quickly tell a story about Mark Whitwell and why his role in my life is so important. And we talk about it a little bit in the podcast as well, but... Uh, Mark Whitwell is uh, from New Zealand. Uh, he's an older gentleman, one of the great esoteric uh, and eloquent and accomplished and uh, truly authentically original yogis have ever walked to this earth. He crossed my path in 2002 when I was uh, yeah, I was having a hard time in life and dealing with some substance abuse issues. And I was in a treatment facility in 2002. And I was in that facility, and at the time I had no money whatsoever, but I befriended somebody who was uh, my roommate there. And this was in Santa Monica, and he said, hey, man, yeah, so you're into yoga, huh? So uh, I, have, I know this guy who teaches yoga at uh, this place called Sacred Movement in Venice. Why don't I take you? So he took me down to Sacred Movement, which became Exhale in Venice, and introduced me to this guy, Mark Whitwell. And when I was in treatment, um, you know, going to these early yoga classes of his really, you know, they just really, really grounded me and got me back into my center. And to continue the journey, you know, I didn't really have any money and couldn't afford going to classes at the time. Uh, Mark gifted me um, yoga for quite a few months at Sacred Movement there. And it, without question, changed my life and set me back on the path of yoga in some shape or form. Uh, you know, I was introduced to the practice of bhakti and, and yoga much earlier in life through Ramdas. 
and the Hare Krishna movement, but you know, never really stuck. I wasn't ready for. Um, I wasn't ready to be a student. So sure enough, in uh, those those rocky times in my life where I was really looking for um, not so much universal answers about what is life and what is consciousness, but I was looking for uh, more just personal answers about what is Zach, who is Zach, and how can I live in this world in a much more gentle and cohesive and um, authentic flow state. And so I thank Mark for that. Uh, with I thank Mark for that just I'm so so grateful for that time in my life. So that is Mark Whitwell in my life, but he is um, you know m- more than that. Um, so he has a, a, a book called he has a couple books, but um, his most recent book is called The Promise You Can Have What You Really Want. And let me read just a couple paragraphs about what the promise means. The promise, the promise, you can have you what can you have really what want, you really by, want Mark by Mark Whitwell. You can change your change life your in just seven minutes, seven a, day. minutes a day. A soft, a soft message, message for a hard time. Hard time. The, the promise is a simple, is a simple yet simple profound yet solution to the cause of all human all discontent. Human discontent. discontent. The, lack the lack of intimacy, of intimacy especially, especially sexual, sexual intimacy. intimacy. Even amidst the plethora of techniques now available for so-called enlightenment, from meditation and visualization to intensive prayer retreats or obsessive exercise regimens, the need for intimacy has been left unsatisfied, requiring just seven minutes a day. The practice taught in this book called Your Seven-Minute Wonder answers that need by opening the body and psyche to gratifying levels of personal and sexual intimacy. So there is a lot of focus in there about the sexual intimacy, no question about it. But what Mark is really getting at is that through a seven minute a day yoga practice, you can um, not just increase the level of intimacy in your life, but you can develop a really a real practice that works for you, that brings yoga to you just seven minutes a day. And so check out this book and uh, listen to what Mark has to say. He really is a, he's a great character. Um, and like I said, so eloquent and authentic. And I think you'll really enjoy this podcast. It was recorded live at Bhakti Fest last month in the desert of Joshua Tree. So there's some ambient noise going around, some starts and stops, and just some interesting bits within the, within the podcast uh, that had to do with the surroundings. Of, of it, but um, yeah, check out what Mark Whitwell is doing. He has all sorts of uh, retreats going on at Esalen, and he's taking a group to Mount Kailash in India um, in 2018, and all sorts of good stuff. So, um, I hope you enjoy this part podcast with Mark Whitwell. I certainly did um, enjoy. <laughs> No, I'm honored, Zach, that you would give me your time and your expertise and your friendship um, to invite me in, into your orbit. Thank you, Mark. Public the communication. The tape is rolling. Mm-hmm. Thank you, mm-hmm. brother Mark. Thank you for yeah. doing it. Welcome to the yeah. podcast. Uh, I'm honored. Uh, um, yeah, so... A lot of roads to start with you. You know, I I have, and I'm going to talk about this in the intro. But you know, I, I have a, uh, uh, you know, I, you don't remember this as well as I do, but I have a very uh, uh, important connection with you because back in 2002, yeah, <laughs> when I was uh, uh, living in a rehab, <laughs> I was taken to your yoga classes at Sacred Movement, and, yeah. and you guested me for a while while I. Had no money, and it really uh, changed my my health. Yeah, changed my uh, how I thought about myself. Yeah, changed a lot. So, but I want to talk about you and, and, and your journey. You've um, maybe we could just start at the beginning. How how did you arrive at, at your own path of being a yogi and crossing paths with Desika Char and the Krishna Krishnamacharya lineage? How does a young man from New Zealand, wind up here. Thank you for this beautiful question and giving me the opportunity to speak to you and your people out there. Um, Thank you for this beautiful question. I just want to say I remember that meeting with you years ago and how touched I was to meet um, a very 
bright young man who is having some difficulties in life at a, a, a recovery place in Los Angeles and how you came with full enthusiasm and full inquiry and with much um, hope, much faith, shraddha, the, you approach the teacher with shraddha, with faith in yoga, it's fundamental to yoga. Yes. <clears throat> and you came with that and I was, I, I had the opportunity to teach you and a few of your friends yeah. at that time. We were at a studio called uh, Sacred Movement. Right? Which became Exhale. Yeah, yeah in, in Venice. And uh, it was a very affirming for my life at the time to meet sincere students in need <laughs> who could recognize there was help in this yoga. Yes. You know? And this yoga from Krishnamacharya and Deskachar is uh, the hallmark of Krishnamacharya's work is that there is a right yoga for every person, no matter who the person is. There's no. a way to say that again. There's a right yoga for the person. Yeah, for every person. For every person. No matter who the person is. So the yoga can be brought to them. Yes, we say yoga must be adapted to the individual, not the individual adapted to yoga. Very important. Yeah. So I remember you and your health condition at the time, and mm -hmm. I, my attempt <clears throat> was to give you something that would be truly useful for you at the time. And I think I may have been a little successful in that, was, that you yes. could feel the relevance of uh, <clears throat> the movement of body and breath as one activity, as a, as a unified movement. Body, breath and mind as a, as a, a unified activity. And, um, and we've, we've been friends ever since that time. Yeah. 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 In, this, yeah. in this matter of shraddha, of <laughs> faith, that there's something useful here yes. with the teacher. And uh, so to go to your question about meeting Krishnamacharya and Desikachar, who are my yoga teachers. Um, so I was wandering around India um, as a young man in, a, in a enthusiasm, but also confusion, you know, going to <laughs> this teacher, that teacher, uh, known yogis, unknown yogis, famous gurus. And not really gunny finding what it is you thought you were looking for at first? It took a second? Well, maybe? it was more like naively throwing myself at the feet of any random charming. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and taking it on like, here's the truth, here's the truth. Yeah, right. you know, this must be it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, India offers a lot of that, of course. It still does. Yeah, but I, I did go to India at the inspiration, from the inspiration of the Beatles, I have to, I, my first gurus are the Beatles, Understood, yeah. John Lennon and George Harrison in particular. Yeah. But I met Paul McCartney not so long ago and um, it was a great honor for me to meet him. And I said, I met Paul and said to him, like, thank you, thank you for all that you've done for me. <laughs> and for humanity, you know, you changed my life as a 15-year-old boy listening to those first Beatles albums. By 19, I was in India uh, because they had confessed their lives, their personal interest in in the Mahesh Yogi, the TM yeah. teacher. And it, in that book, um, Phil Goldberg's book, American Veda. Yeah. Yes, and it's such a beautiful job of putting that into context and how huge that really was. Yeah. So many Westerners didn't know anything about this. It was a deeply yeah. important work yeah. that they did. And I, so I went to Paul and, and first of all, so, you know, he treated me very graciously as a fan, you know, thanking yeah. him for, but then I, it was a very nice meeting. Then I said to him, well, actually you guys, almost single-handedly changed this world. You ended hierarchical systems. That's right. You made it obvious to us all that it was okay to be an ordinary person. That a working class hero was something to be. <laughs> you know, it was okay to be ordinary. It was okay to be what you are. And those linear processes of hierarchical attainment in, in the secular world as well as the spiritual world, which is a big subject. Right. Uh, 
it was okay not to be a Buddha, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it was okay not to be on the right hand of the Pope. Well, and that's Dharma. That's yeah. Dharma. Yeah. And I and I said, and thank you, Paul, for doing that. And you did it because you stayed completely ordinary people. You expressed your ordinary human condition, your ordinariness, while you were the most famous, wonderful people on planet Earth. <laughs> uh, that's what I said to him. And he heard me then, and, and it was a beautiful moment for me because then we moved into an actual dialogue as friends, as people. Oh, beautiful. And it was so lovely. And this is recent. Yeah, it's yeah, not recent. so long ago. Okay, yeah. And I was so happy to have that conversation, to meet a Beatle and have an actual dialogue and be able to thank him for changing the hierarchical systems that, that humanity, that civilization was built upon. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's really funny meeting a beetle is really, a, it's a seminal thing because you really like, you know, I've been fortunate enough to cross paths with many accomplished, great, you know, modern avatars, but meeting a beetle <laughs> is different. It's different because <laughs> it's, it's, it's the beginning. Yeah. That's the when beginning. It, yeah, it all know? exploded then. It all exploded then, yeah. you know. I mean, the girls screaming in Liverpool and screaming in New York, that explosion of energy in the white world. You yes, know? right. Hearing the, you know, the black African uh, pulse, the, the pulse of life. Yes. Uh, but bringing it into just rejigger it into a, yeah into white like, form and then white radio and electronic delivery of music <laughs> and and um, uh, you know Dan, Danny Goldberg you know Danny mm -hmm. great, great, great you know uh, music business legend has this, this great uh, you know hypothesis theory on the reason that English is became really the international language is because of the Beatles. It was the first act. It wasn't Elvis. Elvis, right. the technology wasn't there quite then for Elvis. Well, well, we have to thank Elvis because we have to thank John Elvis. Lennon heard Elvis and said, I yeah. want to be that. Yeah, we have to thank Elvis, but the yeah. Beatles were like, everybody like, you know, was heard that was learning English through listening to the Beatles yeah. in Thailand and Malaysia and then they were going around the world and people were mouthing English. Yeah. And yeah, fascinating. But, and I want to tell you that I, that John uh, Paul was very humble. He, in this conversation I had with him, he said, uh, "You know, I see what you mean. That's true. <laughs> we can do that." He said, "Thank you." He said, but then he said, "You know, we didn't plan for that. <laughs> we didn't set out with that in mind." Yes. And I thought that was part of the the great grace of it or the humility of it you know it's like he wasn't claiming anything you know he never claimed anything you know? like John Lennon never claimed anything he was just like claiming to be himself with all of his pain yes all of his human pain he said this is it this is me this this is my these are my hopes my dreams this is this is my um, hopefulness but here is my misery well John really wore it yeah. front and center yeah so the, the, the Beatles, they inspired you to go to yeah, India. It's because you're, of that that I there. started screaming and dancing as a teenager in the suburbs, middle class suburbs of this Western society. New Zealand. Zealand. Yeah. yeah. And and it just clearly there was more on offer than what was being dished up to me in schools and universities. Sure. So I went to university for a while only to drop out very quickly and went off to follow my dreams and went for an education in India. And I thank the Beatles <laughs> for showing that way, you know. So what was your... And I want to thank yeah. some other great personalities too. One in particular was Ram Dass, Richard Albert, who had written that wonderful book way back then called Be Here Now. Yeah. And I remember like having sort of dropped out of university and sitting on the front porch in my little hippie house where I had a horse in, in the north of New Zealand among Maori communities and reading that book and going, fuck, <laughs> whoa, you know. And so there was a major uh, education in that and I just am so grateful for those people like Ram Das and, and uh, Ramesh Das and Sham Das and Krishna Das and Jayatal, yeah. these young men who went off to India uh, and I have to thank our forefathers before them who who gave us, uh, who 
freed ourselves from the danger of, of fascism in Europe yeah, that's right. and made us, you know, protected our, our Western democracies, our freedom. And, yeah. You know, by the, the time our generation came along, we had a little bit of money and we could, we were free to roam. Right. We were free to go in India. Right. And there's World War II, World War I happening, the great dark misery of Europe. And there were benevolent, benign, sublime people in India in those dark years, like Ananda Mai Ma or Ramana Maharishi or Bhagavan Nityananda or Neem Karoli Baba, Sai Baba, Shirdi yeah. Sai Baba, sure. such a Sai, extraordinary human extraordinary lives yes. of our own time. You know, some of these <coughs> uh, Bhagavan Ramana Maharishi died only in 1951, uh, Nityananda in 61. You know, these are people of our own. You mean Pearly Baba in 73? That's yeah. right, of our own time, you see. Yeah. And so this it's a very recent um, transmission, yeah. spiritual transmission from these great well, human beings. Well, what's interesting about it is, yes, it's, it is kind of this recent transmission, but it's also, um, uh, I, I want to say, almost like compressed in a way because like I know there are great teachers alive today and I'm not this isn't a comment on them or anything but like that can't happen in the same way again like you know I don't think there's really a space for the next Ramana Maharshi <laughs> at the moment you know <laughs> I that, think from our perspective <laughs> we we would be saying that and people some, would disagree but maybe some humility yeah. uh, good humility to say that uh, and because it is, it is acknowledging just who they are. Yeah. And it's also acknowledging that they were just like um, half a generation back. Right. But the availability of the cities, of the uh, the transmission of grace yes. from Nim Karoli Baba and from Nityananda, and yes. from Ananda Mai Ma, etc., is very much of our own time. Yes. And my own yoga teacher, Krishnamacharya, the teacher of BKS Iyengar, his availability, I mean, he died in 1989. He is like so much of our own years. Yes, Krishna Machar died in 89? Yes. That's it. Oh, wow. Yeah, you see, he. Oh, my and, goodness. But um, uh, Ram Das and all those beautiful Das brothers, they did a little bit of pioneering as young men going off and even yes. finding Bhagavan Das. Yeah. Finding. Nim Karoli Baba and then communicating it. So I, yeah. I have much gratitude for all of those people, including the Beatles, including those young pioneers who uh, took their spades to India and dug up the gold, the, the diamonds, you know, and communicate what what they learned from it in their own language. Right. Uh, Shamdas, in particular, a dear, dear friend of mine, and I'm such a uh, spiritual um, brotherhood camaraderie and, uh, and communication is so dear to me and so important to me and I think this is the time that we live in where um, that the great tradition of, of uh, human wisdom that is founded on thousands of years of human insight and human realization and the utterances of many Realizes along the way, including right up into this modern time, that is available to us tangibly, actually, in our lives. How so? How is it attainable? Because, because we were there with them. Ah, uh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Their their lives are not so long ago. Yes. Their their um. Their tangible influence is continues to reverberate through the whole world, through the whole world. And it is a strange thing in the human condition that if there's any human being who's lived their life um, unobstructed in body and mind from the power of creation, then after their life, their power and transmission seems to continue on and on and this is through an the people amazing touched. Yeah. Yes. well through the people that 
the touch, but also through the places that where they abided. Yes, right. And <laughs> also mysteriously and simply the remembrance of that person. Yeah. It seems to be true. I mean, Christians can tell you this. Yes. The whole this is the whole entire wisdom tradition of humanity is this relationship with guru and Christianity there's great guru culture you know right. Islam a great guru culture yeah. of you know people feeling a tangible intimacy with a, a human other and I'd say that and then passing it down and passing yes. it down and communicating it exactly yeah, sure. yeah. exactly is it, you know, the universal method of all, the entire wisdom tradition of all humanity <laughs> and from all different times and all different geographies, <laughs> you know, it all comes down to human transmission of spiritual wisdom is in the, the tangible relationship, the tangible affection between two actual people. Yes in the one reality in which everything is arising. And we need that relationship with somebody who we trust, the Shraddha. But do you think we need that relationship in material form, or can it be sort of in esoteric form? Well, there's a statement that dead gurus don't kick ass. And huh. you can build a lot of an illusion around... Well, I have a dead guru. Well, I just want to say... <laughs> <laughs> I'd say, look, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely possible, of course. Yes. Uh, however, in yoga, we regard to have a, a relationship with an actual living other person yes, so. is, yes. is very beneficial. Yes. And anyway, uh, in these great guru faith systems, which is the whole you know, world tradition of religion. Yeah. You know, it's okay. faith systems of, right. of tangible relationship with a guru, dead or alive, who is not obstructed from the power of creation, who is the power of creation in human embodiment. And in that tangible mutual affection between two actual people, it becomes obvious that we are in the one reality that is arising as all things, you see. As, as the source, the absolute condition of reality. Okay, so itself. the question that arises for me from that is why do you think it is that that sort of realization of being in that one reality and everything that emanates from it, why is that uh, realization, why do you think it, it is realized through the relationship between two people? What is it that comes from that relationship that produces that? Well, I just think because relationship is our condition. We are in prior relationship. We are the power of the cosmos. We are, it's a fact. Yeah. The power of the cosmos brought this body, this beautiful body, your beautiful body, into existence. <laughs> um, yeah, no, but it's something that, because the individual trip of just being like, trying to get there on your own. Yeah. You know. Now and then there's someone who does, they can meditate in a cave for four or four years and they make themselves manifest it. That happens, that's rare, but it happens. But they but we do need the interpersonal connection. But my we point, do. Yes, we do. And my point is that we cannot get there. There is no getting to it because we already are it. See. My state my statement is you are Zach. Yes. You are the power of this cosmos. What could have created this beautiful embodiment? You are tangibly in your flesh, your living flesh, you are the power of creation. You are the power of this cosmos arising as a pure intelligence, how your body is functioning, how the whole body, how the skin is breathing, the lungs are breathing, the, uh, the eyes are seeing, the ears are hearing, the mind is functioning, the heart is beating, the sex is moving. Yes. This is beyond, beyond understanding how this could be happening. Science can't explain what this is. It can describe it in a lot of detail, but it can't say what it is. Right. And you are that. And it is arising. The power of this cosmos is arising as a pure intelligence and utter beauty. Everything in the natural world is utterly beautiful. You can say the one thing that you can depend upon is the 
the beauty. I'm not saying you're you're a beautiful man, put you on the cover of a man's no, 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 man. No. I'm saying not yeah. that kind of insidious yeah. beauty that's caused so much pain the in superficial our world. Level, yeah. yeah, not the idea of media beauty, but the beauty, the beauty of reality itself is arising here as this body. Or just arising as this, I mean, look, look where we're sitting right yeah, now. Yeah, I mean, look, look around. Yeah, yeah. So it is beauty looking at the beauty of that tree. Yes. The power of creation is arising as all things, you see. And furthermore, your body is already established in perfect harmony with the rest of the cosmos. Intrinsic harmony. You know, your body knows exactly what it's doing with air. Exactly mm. what it's doing with light, what it's doing with the green realm. It's already with what it's doing with the water. It's established in this uh, harmony, perfect harmony with the abundance of reality itself. And the other thing I like to point out is that this one of the great harmonies is the male-female collaboration by which yes. that generates new life. Yes. That regenerates, it is the nurturing force of life that's been so messed up by civilization, yeah. by religious uh, fundamentalism, the imposition of ideas around sexuality and male, female. Well, the, the, the concept of sin is a yeah, it's a, just hi highly problematic. It's totally yeah. messed up yeah. humanity, and this is something yeah. that we are purifying this lifetime. We are addressing that issue. So, but in in that it cannot be realized in any sort of like linear process. There's no getting to this. You know, my great teacher, Yuji Krishnamurti, is saying that the problem is in the looking, because if you're looking for something, it implies it is absent. And so, so he says the looking is the problem. Right. You're, you're looking, 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 and all your efforts and thought structures are around this looking for God, when in fact God is oh. arising yeah. as this. Here is God. Yeah, when you said that, I mean, I, I, I immediately sprung into not lo the looking for God thing. I understand that, but looking like, for me, I'm, I'm constantly, part of my Achilles heel is um, the relationship thing. You know, the looking, the looking, the looking. Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, you're, and, we're all caught up in the dysfunction, the mess that yeah. society has made, which is another subject we can talk about. <laughs> yeah, but, but I, the looking for the God. Yeah, looking the, for God. The, yeah, yes. the, there's no getting to God. The great statement that religious life is not looking for God, not trying to find God. Religious life is participating in God. And realizing that you've already found God. It's you are, right, it's you right are that. You are that. Yeah. Tots, Which tots. is where yoga comes in, because yes. yoga is one's direct intimacy with reality itself. That okay. Some cultures So let's, let's unpack this for a second. But can I just say yes. to the question of why we need relationship, with Please. a realizer, there was yes. someone who is abiding, self-abiding as yeah. the power of creation. Is what I said, the power of creation arising as pure intelligence and utter beauty in perfect harmony <laughs> with the rest of the cosmos. Yes. We need that relationship with such a one, and it is that relationship itself that we enjoy where we discover that is indeed our own condition. Absolutely. Otherwise, but without that relationship, we are left in the thought structures that society has given us. Can't get of, out of your own way. Yeah, the attempt of trying to get to. Right. And this is kind of insanity. But you also, you just, you're the, uh, trying to arrive someplace, but also not being able to get out of your own way because every sort of obstacle, most of the obstacles that you impose are self-imposed. They're self-realized. They're, 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 they're self -realized. And the relationship with the teacher, with the you, and self at Sacred Movement 2002 and later Ramdas that helps me remove those obstacles and see them for the yeah. illusionary sort of metaphysical And that's what I'm fuck. saying. We must yes. be very careful about who we choose as our teachers because yes. teaching is used as a power, as an instrument of power. Yes. And it literally is business. So let's talk and, about... And arbitrary practices are given in these delusionary uh, ideas of people who claim to be gurus. Okay, so this is very important. What you just said with, before too, how this brings us to yoga, and yoga is the, 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 the how did you phrase it, the intimacy of... I say direct intimacy. Direct intimacy. With reality itself. With reality itself, the, through the practice of movement, breath, yeah. movement and breath. Essentially, that's, that's Essentially the essential that. matter. 
okay. and everything else arises from that. So Krishnamacharya, and for those of you who are listening who don't know who Krishnamacharya is, but Krishnamacharya is essentially the, he is the godfather of yoga as we know it yeah. today, period. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, you know, all the, the asana sequences that you are also familiar with, they all come from Krishnamacharya. However, Krishnamacharya was a bhakta. Yes. And his teachings somehow, through the asana practice, some of the more, um, I guess, the beautiful sort of intertwinings and interconnectivity of what this practice means has stripped away, gotten stripped away, and we've been left with just this yeah. Yeah. thing yeah. that's happened. Yeah. So, <clears throat> Yes, Krishnamacharya of our own time died only in 1989, lived yes. 101 years old. Maybe. There's 101 useful years, you <laughs> see. His son was Desikachar and his early students from the time in, in the uh, palace of Mysore, the Maharaja of Mysore, who were indeed Mr. Iyengar as a very young man and Patabi Joyce. Joyce. Right. And the work that Mr. Iyengar and K. Patabi Joyce have done is about 80% of yoga in America today in the Western world. The studio yoga business yes. is from these two gentlemen whose teacher was Krishnamacharya, my teacher. But it has to be understood that Krishnamacharya was really ignored in this popularization of yoga. And I am saying that the principles that Krishnamacharya brought forth from the great tradition need to be included now in all the systems of yoga, the styles of yoga that derived from him. And they are essentially uh, Iyengar yoga and Ashtanga Vinyasa yoga and all the systems that derive from them because there have been many sort of variations and brands and styles that are fundamentally derived from Iyengar's Mr. Wood. Yeah. Yeah. So what are these principles? The principles are, first of all, the hallmark of Krishnamacharya's... And, and they're not even his teachings, you see. He was a scholar saying, this is from the great tradition that I am in, that I represent. Not his own, you know, he was never a, a yoga entrepreneur, he was never a yoga businessman, he never had a website, you know? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> like that. He was simply a very sincere person. So, Krishnamacharya would say the hallmark of his work is that yoga must be adapted to the individual needs of each person according to the body type, the age, and the health of each person. There is a right yoga for each person. So, just quickly, so I do drop. So, what that means in just very pragmatic terms is if whatever's going on with you, if you can't do the asana just like the picture, it's exactly. okay. Of course. Yeah. Otherwise, you're caught up in this linear struggle of trying to get somewhere as if you're not somewhere as if you're not the power of the cosmos arising as pure intelligence and utter beauty. And you are. That's just a fact. Yoga is your embrace of that fact, your participation in that fact. And there is a right yoga for every person. That is the direct intimacy with the nurturing power that is life itself. Furthermore, it must be adapted to the cultural background of each person. And this is something masterful of his work, that yoga is not Hinduism, yoga is not religion, but it was used in the ancient world by all religious groups and all language groups, and it went through the ancient world as being very useful to everybody. It's what he called the practical means, I put that in quotations, the practical means by which the ideals of religious utterance, the utterance of realizers and sacred text, those ideals, are actualized through a yoga practice that is intelligently adapted to each and every person according to who they are, their age and their health, mm -hmm. their lifestyle, even their capacity for practice and their cultural background it must be taken into account. So, you know, when we're teaching a Christian, we must adapt it to Christian liturgy or a Buddhist or a Hindu or a Muslim or an atheist. You must respect the position that somebody has through their own legitimate experience in life that must be respected. But how, how do you 
adapt it to a Christian, I mean, in a way that uh, is suitable for them. I mean, right. Well, I just that, I, I don't understand. Uh, just that, uh, as I said before, that Christianity is a great guru culture. Yes. And they have a tangible relationship with a with their master. And there's something I like about it, where Christians know when you I'd say the guru is no more than a friend and no less than a friend. It's a tangible and actual relationship. And Christians have this very good idea of, you know, my friend Jesus, right. <laughs> my personal savior. Right. And it's, it's a very nice idea. And it's very Guru Kripa based with pictures. Totally. You know, the serving, mur murtis yeah. and, and, and yantras, the beautiful cross. Yantras, you know? yes. And many times I've adapted. And prasad even. <laughs> yeah, way, and yeah. See, I call yoga um, whole body prayer to life or whole body prayer to God or whole body prayer to your guru. And this was the way it arrived in ancient times. It was the practice that you did yeah. in your spiritual life, um, often in, in the temple or in your own little puja place in your own home. Is it, is yoga is what you do as a practical response to having been inspired by the great guru transmission or the transmission of anything at all that has inspired you. Yoga is, uh, in Krishnamacharya's line, was <coughs> yoga is the um, response to the guru's grace and a practical response. It's what you tangibly can do Whereas you can't sit in meditation and control the mind. You know, you can't, you can't get enlightened. He say you can't meditate. Meditation is a siddhi that comes. <laughs> that comes as a, as a result of science. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. was saying like, right. trying, to, trying to meditate without asana and pranayama is like trying to sleep without lying down and turning out the light. It just, it can't be done. Okay. So, see, asana and pranayama and meditation is a seamless... Right, and I mean, meditation is the eighth limb. It's, yeah, it's it comes. It right. comes as a result of <laughs> right. your intimacy with life itself. That, that makes the mind clear. Right. So this is the offering from Krishnamacharya that, that he would say is not his own offering. He, like he didn't make it up. He was just carrying it on, transmitting it from this. But, but do you suggest world. that if you are doing yoga with uh, a born again Christian, for instance, in this world? making it up and uh, this born again Christian that perhaps finds uh, the names of the asanas offensive because it is blah blah blah, blah whatever yeah. I don't worship exactly. you exactly not yes. needed not needed and he was a beautiful example in Krishnamacharya's own lifetime is that whenever a Muslim would come for yoga he would he would uh, ban the use of Hindu mantras uh, but you know and adapt the the the, the language of his Muslim friends and neighbors of his own city, Madras, uh, to their, their language, their liturgy, and their, their thought structures of, uh, and, and their religious... You could breathe and inhale, exhale, yeah. Allah Akbar, yeah. inhale, exhale, Exactly. Allah Akbar. In I mean, fact, the Muslim world is the most yogic in terms of world religion because they do some, this five times a day prayer cycle. Right. And we have done that in the Middle East. We've given yoga put the breath into the five times a day prayer cycle and doing that uh, mainly with women in the Middle East and they'll say oh my goodness it turns out that our religion is a religion of love you see it, tur it turns it from exoteric rote practice that they're doing just because it's the custom of their world to a personal practice and make turns it from exoteric to esoteric very, it becomes very personal you see because it is about intimacy with life and the intimacy with the first principle which is your own body mind mm. and then this is what Krishnamacharya would say if you're, that your asana and pranayama is your first spiritual responsibility it's the first action of a bhakta uh, it's the primary practice you with intimacy with your own embodiment, of course, is intimacy with life that allows for intimacy with all of life. You can then be intimate with another. For a Christian, for example, love thy neighbor as thyself. Well, yoga will empower you to do that because you love the, this life, love this body, and this body loves its own experience. So do you th th suggest that, like, you know, when, when you are uh, embodying this practice and, and engaging in this beautiful uh, journey of intimacy, 
that the, 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 the beginning of being intimate with yourself sort of exudes and carries over and blends over to being intimate with the world around you. Exactly. It That's does. not happening. It starts mm. with the body and breath, yes. and then the body has its own intrinsic, already perfectly given harmony with air and water and the green realm and human others and male-female yes. collaboration that is the power of life itself. That's how life is working. And by doing your yoga practice, that simply clicks into place as being obvious and allows us to become participants in those natural harmonies. And the vexed question, of course, is sex and male-female uh, collaboration and how sex has been turned into a vulgarity in this world and very painful and very abusive. Yes. And this is and the burden of pornography that's come out of you know, the religious denial of life. And it's a mess. Yes. And it's a mess that affects all of us, you know, good people everywhere just trying to have a good relationship. But this isn't even just a modern schism. This is a, an ancient schism. It's ancient. It's born from patriarchy. Of, it it of, came out of doctrinal imposition. It came out of doctrinal and, and uh, demonification of female form. Yeah. And before that, female form was celebrated and yeah. worshipped. And we are here to clean that up. There's three words I want to clean up. God, I want that to be purified, that word. Yes. Guru, I want that to be purified because it's been turned into a dreadful mess, yes. especially yes. in America in yes. the last 40 years. Yeah. And sex, yeah. which has a long, many, many generations of pain around that, that has come from the doctrinal denial of the feminine and of sex. Yoga teaches that through the union of opposites, we know the source of opposites. Through male and female collaboration as equals and opposites, where one pole empowers the other, we know the nurturing force of reality itself that is arising as our very body and breath and sex. And this is, an, this is what is delivered when people do a tangible yoga practice that's designed yep. correctly for them. So let's talk about the tangible form yoga practice. I've noticed in the last, I don't know, five or six years of your life, of your work, you have distilled this into something that is, uh, you know, and I, I suspect is intentionally very accessible. Yeah. And you, you've uh, you distilled it and isolated it down to where every, pretty much if you're, alive and breathing and not six feet under, you could do some form of this. Yes. Yes. And let's talk about what that practice is. And I know so many people listening or, or you know, you have this, this this preconceived notion of yoga. It's like, oh my God, I got to go to a sweat for 90 minutes in this class and I don't exactly. want to, I can't do it. And I look like an idiot bending around and these people, they're sitting on their heads and I can't do that. Yeah. So what, what should I do? In my Instagram today, I have photos of asana. And then these three words, do your yoga. And Krishnamacharya couldn't speak any English, hardly anything at all, but he learned these three words, do your <laughs> yoga. And he used to frequently tell his family and friends and students those three words, do your yoga. <laughs> okay. His son, Desika Char, brilliant young engineer who took up the mantle of his work and uh, communicating it in a way that could be understood by the Western mind. He was at university in New Delhi, and he told me a letter came from his father, and it had three words in the letter. Do your <laughs> yoga. So what, is, what does it mean? Love father. And the emphasis is on your yoga. Your, the, this is talking about a personal practice that is your practice that you do at home. The problem of going to classes is that you're then doing somebody else's yoga, somebody else's patterning that's been devised often as a standardized practice in a linear, in a muscular male struggle uh, to get to some idealized future possibility for yourself. And the, the development of the yoga studio business is essentially about that. Now, many people have got intelligent and realized that there's got to be some uh, adaptation of these standardized styles. And I think we're in this early experiment in yoga in the West where it's just suddenly come in through the young men who are with Krishnamacharya, Mr. Iyengar and Patabi Joyce. But now we're going, oh, hang on a second. You know, what do we do? 
with this. Now, what I'm saying is that the principles that Krishnamacharya brought forth from the great tradition must be now included in all the yoga that derived from him, that somehow curiously missed these principles. The West was able to popularize something that seemed more like gymnastics, yes. seemed like male muscular, more like the Western mind could sort of understand, sort of like the fitness business, fitness. where you work away on yourself and yeah. get to some amazing future place, right. only to find that you wear your joints out and you burn out your nervous system. <laughs> <laughs> and and there's also this idea, this Western idea of like, you can get your ass kicked. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. You know, yeah. So the West knows that, and but this is not a very healthy system, you know. We're in New Zealand, we have sportsmen die at the age of 35 who seem incredibly fit, you know, who have this conventional fitness. And the yoga is a bit like that, you know, how it's being taught. So I'm saying, please, everybody, please pause. We must now include the principles from the great tradition and what has been popularized. And that is easy to do, actually. You can take the entire portfolio of Mr. Iyengar's asana, that beautiful book of photography called Light on Yoga. Mm -hmm. You can take all of that so asana beautiful. and you can put the technology of asana that Krishnamacharya taught. And that is essentially that the breath is the guru or the gauge to the asana. The breath is your own guru. Exactly. To, to leading you through this practice of asana. Exactly. If yes. you're with the breath, you're with that which is breathing you. And that the asana, the posture, is for the breath. It's for the merge of the inhale with the exhale. Yeah. With the exhale strength, the inhale receptivity, and they must be there, equal. Why do you think, this is kind of a, a side question, but why does the human condition feel so prone to hold its breath. Why do, what is that about? When there's fear, you can't inhale or exhale. The breath just stops. It's a biological response to fear. When there's anger, you can't exhale. When there's sorrow, you can't inhale. And we get fixated in these patterns of fear, anger, and sorrow in the human condition for good reason. <laughs> it's terrible <laughs> what society has delivered to the usual life, you know. So we live in these patterns of fear, anger, sorrow, and the breath patterning around them, but might have some very good reason in the biology of a, of a natural life. I'm not saying it's wrong. There's good reason to be fearful or anger, angry or sorrowful. However, we get fixated around these patterns and the patterning of the breath. And what yoga does is if you participate on a daily basis in the whole body breathing, where the inhale and exhale are equal, mm -hmm. and the movement of the anatomy, this is called asana, allows for this full receptivity of an inhale and a full exhale strength that is receiving that is the male and female collaboration of your own embodiment because we are all male female we came from male female all of life is male female a flower is male female exchange of chemistries you know we are male female so it is participation this is what asana is the hatha yoga the non-dual tantra of direct intimacy with reality itself that is arising as the whole body, as power, as intelligence, as beauty, mm. in perfect harmony. This is the natural state. We are that. Right. Our yoga is participation in that fact. And the patterns that we otherwise live by are released through the breathing process because when you're breathing fully and evenly, then you release these patterns of fear, anger, or sorrow. Yes. Yes. And this, I can just, this is why I call my book The Promise, because I promise you this, this works. This is anciently given. A lot of case studies to prove this. Absolutely, <laughs> thanks, thanks for looking at my book. Yeah, there are case studies there. Yes. But you know, it was anciently given, not not exclusively by Krishnamacharya. He never made it up and called, gave it a brand name and had a website. Yeah. Uh, he was a scholar of the great tradition. and he, His work is beautiful because he's basically, as a, an academic, he's saying, this is yoga. And even more importantly, this is how an individual does yoga that's right for them. 
So, the promise, seven minutes a day, is is your intro. That's what I ask that, people to do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and I, I have a book called The Promise and an app called I Promise. Yep. And another app, a second app called The Yoga Promise. So and I'm asking people to begin to take up a short practice. Nothing, I say, yoga must be actual and natural and non-obsessive in your daily life. <laughs> and your personal, but you're not trying to get anywhere. You're only participating in what is already given, you see. God is given. Yes. God has created these forms. So it kind of puts you a little bit, a, a little bit at odds with what, where yoga has gone in the West, a little bit, where, where you sit. And at the same time, you also, you're a very likable guy. You also exist in the same world, but while also sort of being a little bit of a, you know, you're rebelling against in a way. But I would so, say the opposite, actually. <laughs> I'm, I'm the mainstream conservative the, guy yes. who's representing the great tradition as it came through and Krishnamacharya. Yes. And there's all these radicals out there who <laughs> grabbed a little piece of it and turned it into their own brand and style. And, and nobody owns yoga. You know, yoga is like the mother's milk of culture. Yes. Yoga is the mother's milk of religious life that even religion has eliminated from its doctrines. And it needs to be there. So I'm the guy saying, hey, come on, everybody. Come on, world. Come on, yoga world. And come on, all the world. Start a sadhana. Do some yoga that is actually right for you, that is the union of opposites in your own system that you can do you can do this it's not a struggle towards a future result and so many people out there in the world say yeah i've looked at yoga nah it's not for me it's too hard i'm not i'm not flexible you know and they're, they're the world is the mainstream world is intimidated by the branding of yoga that's come through in the Very last much couple so. of decades yeah, you know a question you know if i see you know one more amazing backbend on a mountainside or by the ocean, you know, the Instagram. Uh, the Instagram yoga, thing. Yeah, you know, this is, and the public are seeing that, and frankly, they are intimidated by it. Of course. It's very hard to do. Why yeah, wouldn't they be? I know, but yeah. in fact, an actual yoga practice is not hard to do. It, you can do it. That's the point. There's even the meaning of the word sadhana. Mm. Krishnamacharya's translation of that beautiful Sanskrit word is sadhana means that which you can do. You can tangibly do it. Well, you cannot meditate. You cannot go into samadhi. You cannot fight the mind for some future spiritual realization. You can't even control the mind. What you can do is a beautiful moving and breathing practice that is right for you, your body type, age and health that then bears the gifts or the siddhis, the results of a clear mind, of a mind that is then in meditation spontaneously and naturally, or just the feeling of intimacy with life yes. and with all of life, including if there is guru, a guru culture, uh, intimacy with your friend. And there's a, there's a big discussion, your friend, I mean, including your intimate friend, maybe your intimate partner. Yes, whoever that may be. Yeah, yeah. whether that's same sex or opposite sex intimacy, it's all, it allows for intimacy with life in every way. Um, it's funny, all roads lead back to John, Paul, George and Ringo. <laughs> Here we are. Well, Just I got think started. <laughs> they, 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 they kick the ball upfield, you know, big punt, you know, we're all running to catch it. And there, there's been some wonderful, you know, modern uh, realizers, even of our own time, as we've discussed. And yes, I feel it's our sincere job to get the job done and deliver this to humanity and so, all around the world. So to, for, you have the book, The Promise, mm -hmm. you have your app, which yeah. is actually a lot of fun. I promise, okay, I and promise. the yoga promise. And yeah. we've got the, hip, the website is heartofyoga.org. Heartofyoga.org, and, and for we people. Just, we put a documentary out there called The Hope for Humanity, that I'm not pleased yeah. to have never seen come this. out. Yeah, it's out there now. Mark. So we're doing all these tangible things to try to communicate, and I have to say that 
we have the second global brain that where the whole world is now interconnected. I'm just amazed. I've just been in Bali and in India, and the, even poor people are holding smartphones. It's amazing. Yeah. And this is what my hope for humanity. Yeah, I, mean, I was in India that, this year, and yeah, yeah, really. That we amazing. will put this information down those glass tubes yeah. of light for people, you know. And I think this is what I'm saying. Is and I thank you, Zach, for being my yeah. comrade in this. To get the job done and give to all people everywhere this intimacy with their own life. The life that, the power of this cosmos that brought us all here in the first place is presently sustaining us. Let's give that to all people and then they'll be then we'll be okay. Then we'll start cooperating with Mother Earth's ecologies and so forth. And if everybody could just realize what a beautiful, intimate, fantastic experience this is anyway. Exactly. Just as it is. The ordinary condition. The fact that you're even here. Exactly. Is the odds are very much against you. Yeah. The fact that you're here breathing and able to dance in this cosmic conscious field is is a miracle. Totally. And I think it's possible now to give it to all people. I think it is. Tangible, uh, intimate connection to their own lives. Mark, thank you.